I want to take um, a step back a little bit, uh, try to um, express to you and, and help you get a better feeling for what the blockchain is, how it's going to change the world, um, but more importantly, why it's going to change the world, what is so very different. Could I get a quick show of hands? Who thinks they, they really understand why the blockchain makes so much difference? One person. Two, three, okay. Not all that many. Okay, so what do we mean by a game changer? It's always nice to quote uh, Mr. Mr. Fuller. He, he was full of um, very interesting gambits. Basically, what he's saying here is that um, there's very little point, if you want, really want to engender change, there's very little point actually trying to fight a model. Um, what you need to do is create a new model that basically makes the current system redundant, right? So that's really the benchmark about how we should be judging blockchain, if we really want to understand if it's actually gonna make a real difference. Here are some pictures. This, these pictures are meant to, in some sense, um, to model, uh, to give you an idea of the current model, the old model. Um, you might recognize some of these. Now, what's common about all these things? Let's try and explore what, what all of these, these guys have in common. We call them all institutions. Um, in some sense, they're all regulated or are actually arms of the government. Um, but let's take a more concrete view. What is it that they actually do day to day? Um, I'm gonna characterize it with like three very particular things. So the first thing is, the, um, is this kind of notion of a, of a signed message, right? So we've got this like this old school seal and you can write a message on an envelope and seal it. And you can be, in some sense, sure, assuming someone hasn't managed to, uh, <laughs> to, to copy the seal, um, that it came from one particular person. And so all of our particular, uh, all of our uh, examples, um, in some sense, check to see whether their client instructions or their customer instructions actually came from the customer they purport to come from. The second thing I'll, I'll point out is this notion of bookkeeping, record keeping, right? Um, they all have some form of record keeping. For banks, it's really obvious. It's uh, the account, maybe the account number, the name, how much is in the balance. That's the very important bit. Um, uh, but land registry is obviously something similar. Um, gambling uh, enterprises, again, something similar. Different information, but still there's a notion that there are records. And these records have to, have to remain uh, precise, very accurate over time. It's no good if the records change arbitrarily. Um, and then finally, the abacus kind of represents this idea of, uh, of reckoning up, right? So there is some notion that all of these things, they all do reckoning. They all, they all do some sort of processing or arithmetic or apply some sort of process or logic to this information that is incoming. And if we think about it in a, in a sort of more engineering way, we can kind of draw arrows between them. In some sense, the, the information that comes in from the clients, these instructions, get combined with the things that we already know because they're in our records, and we do some sort of reckoning up, and then we put some information that we've distilled back into the records, and so it can continue. Now, you know, 50, 70 years ago, that's kind of how these places look. Lots and lots of people. Um, this is actually from the, uh, from the code breakers uh, thing. So this was actually called a computer, right? And it was called a computer, a human computer. Um, it, it's just literally derived from the Latin. Um, putere is, is, is to, to reckon up, basically. Um, and that's what a computer looked like. Um, of course, today it's a little different, but the basics have, have remained unchanged. So if we consider these institutions literally as that, that record keeping, the execution of instructions, and the reckoning up, is that really what an institution is? Or is there something additional? Of course, we're missing something. That's not, institutions do something more than just reckoning stuff up and keeping records and, um, and, and managing the, the, the instructions from their clients. Um, but it's very difficult to put our finger on it because if we think in concrete manners, that's actually all they're really doing. So what's this magic ingredient that makes an institution an institution and not just someone with a calculator? They manage contention. The fact that these numbers have a meaning, the fact that if there's a large number next to my name in a bank account balance means that I'm actually rich and I no longer need to get up to go to work. And if there's a zero, then it means I'm poor and I really do have to go up to go to work. Um, that's really important. And the fact that there's only a limited amount of resources, so the fact that these numbers actually have to add up, leads to the fact that everybody who interacts, everyone that has a little line, a little number next to their name, are in contention. 
they have a differing set of interests. If I transfer money, it's in my interest that my balance doesn't go down. It's, it's a, if I had operation over the bank's machines, if I had in some sense administrator privileges, and I were able to change the numbers in a bank server, then I'd be a bit stupid if I didn't change my number very, very high. It's, that's, that's, that's the way these things work. There is contention between the participants. But yet we still want to engage other participants. We still want to engage within the financial system. We want to be able to use the financial system. We want to be able to transfer money. And so we impose authority. This, if you're not familiar, is a, is a, is a character from a, um, a, an American comedy uh, called South Park. And this, this represents authority. So what we do is we say, right, um, the bank will have authority over all of this data, all of this information, or everybody's account numbers. Or in the case of land registry, then we, we, the government generally denotes a particular institution and says, right, you guys have authority over who owns what land, okay? We impose authority. And what authority does is it allows us to manage contention because we have a very particular reference, a canonical piece of information as to who owns what, or in general, what the state of the world is. Now, for a casino, that particular point of reference is actually just who has what chips in their pocket and which chips are on the table in which position. But nonetheless, there is authority, right? We, we specify what the, uh, the, the reference state is. So we can kind of model our, our institution in this way. The institution has some, some kind of computation going on inside, some processing, bookkeeping, managing of instructions. But on the outside, and the critical bit is, it's an authority unto itself. And because we trust that authority, we're able to interact. If we didn't trust it, we wouldn't be able to interact because we wouldn't want to interact because we would fear that the author, this particular institution didn't properly represent our interests. Maybe, they're, maybe they don't have the money to actually give us, if they're a bank, maybe there's a bank run, maybe they're, 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 they're underfunded, they're undercapitalized. If they're a, a gambling house, maybe the, the games are rigged. Trust is super important. The only reason we can interact with most of the institutions are because we trust them. We trust them not to misuse their authority. So the old model can be characterized as having a bunch of these institutions, and they're all authorities unto themselves. There is sort of a, a ring going on, and they can communicate with each other, um, but that communication is terribly error-prone, and much of financial technology is trying to maybe make that communication a bit better. They each have their own little sort of processing stuff going on. They've got their abacuses. I mean, of course, today the abacuses are, are very much more silicon and uh, uh, less beady, but they, they are nonetheless basically abacuses. Um, they've got their record keeping, um, and they've got their, uh, their, their sort of digital, their, their signatures, so they can check who's, who's actually uh, sending messages and, and if those messages are valid. And so in the last, I don't know, whatever, 30 years or so, um, we've seen that, you know, the record keeping material has sort of changed to magnetic disk drives and now, of course, solid state. We've seen that uh, silicon has largely replaced abacuses as our means of doing the reckoning up. And if you don't know that, that sort of mathematical looking uh, figure, that's actually the, uh, the elliptic curve um, thing. It's, it's a particular mathematical formula. Uh, and that allows us, at least with, with Bitcoin and Ethereum, to, uh, to, to check that a particular message is actually from a particular identity. And what we end up with are these new kinds of computers. They're no longer rooms full of people like summing things up. They're, they're little boxes like that one. Well, where has this landed us? The issue that we have today, it hasn't really changed anything, right? Banks are still banks. That, that diagram with the, 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 the little um, institutions in a circle, that remains as true today as it ever did. And that's kind of a shame. There's, there's something holding us back from, um, uh, from moving on from there. And the issue is that these computers, great though they are, they, they exist within their own basic sort of authority sphere, right? They're like walled gardens. And they're all walled, and that's great. Everyone has absolute authority over their garden um, and no authority whatsoever over anybody else's. And that's basically how we, how we do stuff today. If you look on your smartphone, yet your smartphone, you can change any aspect of your smartphone 
Um, you know, you need to maybe have a bit of technological new uh, nous, but nonetheless, you can actually alter all those numbers in your smartphone. You can make the banking software state that you've got like a million uh, rupees in your account if you want it to. The bank won't honor it, of course, because it's not their computer, it's your computer. And that's how the world exists. That's, that's how we manage IT. And of course, there's your little two men. They're, they're, they're you know, standing apart from each other. Because we can't manage contention in this way. Everyone's garden is different. Everyone has authority only over their own garden. And there's no real way to combine it all into one. So what happens if we can devise a technology where we can take these walled gardens and we can knock down the walls, but rather than suffering the tragedy of the commons, we can actually impl just imbue an automatic sense of law or rules onto the ground that was left. We can create a sort of um, magical garden in which there are very set rules and we can all interact with each other under those rules and we can be absolutely guaranteed that those rules will be enforced. Unlike the current civil law system where uh, basically you have to get a lawyer and go to court if you're going to challenge anything and it will cost a lot of money and for relatively small transactions it's absolutely pointless. What happens if we could build it into nature itself? That would be quite an interesting kind of invention, right? Well, it turns out, amazingly enough, that we have invented that and it's called the blockchain. Here's a, an artist's impression, I'm the artist, of the, uh, the new model, the blockchain. So, in a sense, it is a way of taking a, a global computer network and we've knocked down these walls joining everybody's garden and formed the commons. But the commons has a very, very solid um, set of rules, law attached to it. So solid that nobody can break it. There's no owner, there's no administrator, and therefore there's no uh, privileged organization or institution to have to trust you actually can check that all of the calculation is done absolutely faithfully. And because you can check it yourself, there's no need to trust anybody else. It's authority because we decide it is. All of the information contained on it is information that is very, very much native to this particular shared computer or this shared processing machine. And as we've just considered, basically all of the services that institutions offer boil down to Computation done with authority. And so what we've got is this a pluribus unum, Latin for from many, there's one. So we've taken many, many machines, all of them with people behind them that have very particular interests, and we've combined them into one machine that is completely unbiased. And that is the magic of the blockchain. So to recap, we can do multi-party contentional deals without having to involve a human. Trust, we no longer need. This is the first time there's ever been technology to do this, ever. And so practically speaking, we've commoditized this crazy, intangible, but precious asset, trust. I'm of the opinion that in the future, the notion of having to trust some third party, some institution or organization with our interests will be so archaic, it will seem like working with an abacus does to us today. Thanks. <laughs>